In the previous video, we considered the root locus plot as a useful tool in classical control design. Root locus plot characterizes where the closed loop poles are and how they move as a parameter in your um, open loop transfer function L of S is changed. Um, and so typically we take that parameter as being the overall gain K, but we can uh, take other parameters as well. But we considered the case last time as we adjusted K. And we understood what the root locus plot does by considering three separate special cases. Um, we considered three Three problems which are all semi-proper that have an increasing number of poles and zeros. So this has one pole at the origin and one zero at minus c. This has two of each and this has three of each. And we asked what happens when c approaches infinity. Now again, what we expect to happen is that as k is small, the closed loop poles are near the values of s that make a of s go to zero. So for small k, the closed loop poles are near the open loop poles. And as k is made large, this term gets small. Um, and so the values of s that make the denominator denominator go to zero in this case um, are the values of s that make b of s go to zero. So we expect the closed loop poles to move from the open loop poles to the open loop zeros as k goes from small to large. And so that's indeed what we saw. We solved the first two cases analytically and uh, then we plotted this one numerically. And we saw that um, we had pictures uh, that are well familiar to you by now. And then we considered the case as c goes to infinity um, this picture doesn't change. So in the space of S over C, we still have this picture. So if we want to plot in the vicinity of the origin, so order one values of S in the vicinity of the origin, as we increase C, it is as if we are zooming our attention in towards the, uh, the origin here. And in this case, we have a single branch of the locus going off to the left. Um, in this case, we have a single branch of the locus going off to the right. Here we have two of them, one going up and one going down. Here we have two of them going to the left and the right. And here we have three going off at 120 degree angles uh, with one pattern. And here we have three going off with 120 degree angles, angles with, a, with the opposite pattern. Um, and so that seemed logical, um, but we wanted to get a better understanding of what's going on far from the origin, especially consider a crazy case like this, um, where um, if you just plot, uh, we had a closed form expression for how the closed loop poles uh, move. Closed loop pole moves all the way off to infinity that way, and then jumps around and comes in from the left side in, in this way. And that might at first seem somewhat peculiar. What's going to happen, what's happening uh, with this sudden jump? And is the point at infinity um, as we get there from any uh, different direction a wildly different point? Or where is that point at infinity? How can we better understand it? Riemann provided a great understanding of what we mean about the complex plane when we look far from the origin. So he proposed a stereographic projection which maps a closed loop uh, or, or plane S, which we'll call here the zeta plane. And so any value of zeta in this plane has a real part and an imaginary part. It's just some complex number. And he proposed a projection which maps the complex plane onto the unit sphere. And so um, this projection maps the origin of the complex plane to the south pole and a circle around the origin to a circle near the south pole. Um, here's a circle of radius 1 uh, maps to the equator and if we follow any given line that goes out from the origin, we work our way on a line on the sphere that uh, works progressively farther away from the south pole. So the question is, where does this ray go as it approaches infinity? Well, clearly, it approaches the north pole. And so the mapping of this ray um, as we map it onto the sphere using this stereographic projection maps this ray onto this longitude line uh, that goes from the south pole to the north pole. So I brought an example Riemann sphere here. Um, and so um, if we have any ray um, like this blue line, again, it's going to map onto some longitude line um, that goes from the south pole to the north pole. North pole. So if we go this way, we'll go up here. Um, if we go the other way, we'll go up the opposite side. But the limit um, that the ray shoots off to infinity 
we come all the way up to the North Pole. And so we refer to the point at infinity in the extended complex plane that includes all of the finite points plus the point that is included in the limit um, as the distance from the origin goes to infinity. We refer to that point at infinity in the singular because it is the mapping of the North Pole point. Um, and so this mapping is of course singular. We can't uh, visualize it in the complex plane, but on the Riemann sphere, it makes perfect sense. Okay, so again, these equations um, take real and imaginary parts of zeta um, and correspond to corresponding points x, y, and z on the unit sphere, so the sum of their squares is equal to one, mapping the origin of the zeta plane um, to the south pole. Um, and so if, for instance, x squared plus y squared is equal to one, which is uh, satisfied on the circle, then our z squared is equal to zero, and we are on the equator, um, and other values of zeta r and zeta i, um, if they are uh, uh, the, the sum of their squares is, is less than one, um, requires a, a zeta, uh, sorry, a, a, a z, which is um, negative, um, and so um, that gives us a point um, down in the southern hemisphere, um, and if zeta r squared plus zeta i squared is um, uh, greater than one, um, then that corresponds to z, which is larger, and as the sum of the squares of these things um, approaches infinity, then that corresponds to z, which is approaching 1. So you're moving up to the top of the sphere. So that's the stereo stereographic projection uh, proposed by Riemann, uh, defining the Riemann sphere. So now we are better equipped to understand what's going on um, with uh, these limits that we were talking about. Um, so let's call this point um, minus c um, in the mapping of it. Let's call it right here. Okay, so we're going to map the complex plane to the south pole of this sphere, so the origin maps to the south pole, and this point minus c, um, we'll presume we set this thing up, so this point minus c maps to this x right there. Um, and so in the limit that c goes to infinity, then essentially what we're doing is we're moving that point x to the top of the sphere. And so in the case with k positive, we march from the south pole up to the x, and in the limit that c gets big, it's moving up here. In the case with k negative, to understand what's happening here, we're simply marching up the other side of the sphere. So as k gets larger and larger, um, we go up this side of the sphere and down to the c. And then in the limit that c goes to infinity, we've come up the red side instead of coming up the green side. And this sort of argument um, can be extended to the L2 of S case and the L3 of S case. So in this case, um, for K positive, uh, the two branches of the locus kind of look like rubber bands, going from here to here. Um, and in the limit that C is made large, then those rubber bands are kind of deforming. And so in the limit that C goes to infinity, the rubber band that connected this way is just coming up a latitude line, and the rubber band that connected this way is coming up the latitude line on the opposite side. And that's why we get this picture um, that we have one going off one way and one going off the other way, and we are bisecting the sphere. Similarly for the k negative case, um, it's the same picture, um, but now instead of um, a, a little circle um, that is deforming like a rubber band, we simply have one branch of the locus coming up to this side to the x, and one branch of the locus coming up over the North Pole, smoothly over the North Pole and, and down this side, and the limit that c goes to uh, infinity, um, we again cut the sphere in half, but this way instead of that way. And again, the limit in the L3 of S case, um, as we move this point uh, minus C up to infinity, in the K positive case, we have three branches, one that comes up um, directly uh, along that longitude line, uh, one that's a rubber band that comes over here, one that comes over there, um, and as we move this point up, uh, this line comes up just uh, that longitude line, and this rubber band over here is scooted over to there and becomes a longitude line up this side, and this one comes up this side, and we cut the sphere into three equal pieces, et cetera, as we look at L4 of S, L5 of S, et cetera. So if you're ever confused about the behavior of the complex plane far from the origin, Riemann's stereographic projection onto the sphere helps you to solve the problem. And if you see a crazy behavior like this, it's actually quite smooth. Um, we're just going smoothly 
over the North Pole and coming back in the other side. And so I like to call the North Pole, for those Douglas Adam fans in the, uh, in the audience, as the place where we have the restaurant at the end of the universe. It's some special place um, that we can't even imagine um, if we have a Cartesian coordinate system for our complex plane. But if we map the plane onto the sphere, we can see that we can get there by going off that way or by going off that way. Um, and so it helps us to understand these plots describing the behavior of complex functions far from the origin.